Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today, I, I, I told some people it was dry in Marengo when I started coming over here, and it's wet here, but that's okay. We'll see what's happening. Uh, today, you'll notice with one candle lit here, we're in the Advent season, and so we celebrate and anticipate what's coming up, of course, in December. The only announcement I have is that uh, there's a fundraiser you're doing uh, at Lou Malnati's on Monday, so if you want to be a part of that, there's, I know, information all over here for that. We're going to worship our Lord today, anticipate his coming as a child, and anticipate his coming again as Lord and Savior on the last day. So with all that in mind, we'll remember who we are in Christ as we worship. I'm Pastor Bohard. I've been here a few times uh, before you got your pastor. I hope and pray that you're getting along. Did you need pastor, are you? I hope so. Okay. Good, good. Uh, keep that up, and we'll do great things together uh, for the Lord in Elgin. So, with that in mind, uh, please rise for the invocation. I told a couple of people already that I, yesterday I baptized a great grandson of mine, Hayden, and uh, that was a great day for him, of course, and a great day for the family, too. And when you baptize anyone, you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we do the invocation, we say the same words. And when I baptize anyone, a baby or an adult, you put the sign of the cross on their forehead and over their heart. And when I make the sign of the cross over you with the invocation, it's kind of the same thing. I'm reminding you, I hope, of your baptism. And we live in that all of us. We are at, on page 151 with the invocation and the confession. We worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I think I'm on the wrong page. Thank you. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, but we confess our sins, and God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment to reflect upon our sins. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgive you all your sins, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for the entrance hymn. It's the very first hymn in our hymn book, hymn number 331, The Advent of Our King.
We continue with the Kyrie on page 152. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. On our insert, the salutation, the Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament is from the book of Isaiah, the second chapter. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hill. And all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law, <clears throat> and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the book of Romans, the 13th chapter. O no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we sing the Alleluia verse. <laughs> The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, But concerning that day, the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, 
marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so that the coming soul will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, Savior of the Nations, come. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who once came as a babe, but will come again in power and might, and from the Holy Spirit. And then we pray that he would keep us in the true faith until that day. Amen. Please be seated. My text is the gospel lesson today. Um, it's one of the traditional readings. Last week was the last Sunday in the church year. This week is the first Sunday in the church year. And sometimes they have a similar theme. They're looking at, again, the coming, the coming of Christ. Advent, and with the first candle, 
Um, and sometimes that first candle in Advent is called the candle of hope. As we prepare for what many hope for, for just millennium before Christ was born, they hoped that the Savior would come, and he did in his time. And we hope again that he would be with us, and we know he is, and that we can celebrate his birth. And as we wait, we wait for that second coming, when he will come in again in power and in strength. And that's what this reading from Matthew chapter 4 is all about, uh, the coming of the king. The colors for Advent are this, this blue. Sometimes it's called a royal blue, uh, signifying the royalty of Christ the king coming. And uh, even chapter 24, if you want to remember that chapter, remember the number 24, because it makes me think about the 24 hours in a day. And as the day begins early in the morning, it goes on during the day, it comes to noon, in the afternoon, the evening, and it comes to a completion at midnight. And there'll be a midnight to this world, a time when it's over, when the Lord comes and judges and does what he's going to do in that great, great day. So we think about that, and we think about Advent, and we think about his coming as a babe, and then coming in his glory. As we look at this chapter, I'll give you a couple, three words here to start with an S. And the first one he talks about is, a, it's a secret. No one knows, he says very plainly, no one knows the hour or the day that the Son of Man is going to come again in glory and power, that day of judgment. No one knows. He says, not even the angels in heaven and not even the Son of Man. And he's talking about himself. Only the Father knows that day. And it's a secret. And you might wonder why it's a secret, but it's for, it is. And I don't know if you think about it, the idea that if you knew, <laughs> if you knew that day, when he was going to come again, how would we think differently? How would we maybe live differently? Our sinful nature might be starting to think, well, if I know he's going to come on such and such a day, well, I can basically do whatever I want. And at the end, just before he comes, <laughs> you know, I'll straighten up and live the way I'm supposed to. That's our human nature, trying to get away with whatever we can. We might think that way, or I don't know what else we could think, but if we knew the day, it would change a lot of things. So we don't. Maybe it's better. It is better that we don't know that day that he's coming. It's a secret. And maybe it's hard to understand when Jesus says himself, even I don't know. Here's Jesus, who was God of God, light of light, very God of very God, going all the way back to the very beginning of everything, when there was just God and there was nothing else, in the beginning, he was there. He was there when the world was made. He was there when finally God made Adam and Eve and all the creatures. He was there, and he was there as what, what we call the eternal, the, the divine Jesus. He was there before he was even born. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that was now what we call the the big word is incarnate Christ, the incarnation. When God himself, somehow beyond our ability to understand, God wraps himself in flesh and blood. And he looks like one of us, and he lives like one of us. And in that human nature that he possessed, and which he, if you think about it, still possesses, because when he ascended into heaven after his resurrection, it was his bodily ascension into heaven, he still understands our flesh and blood because he still has his. But that pre-incarnate Christ, even before his birth, is different than now after he's born. He has some limitations on that human side. He was a little baby, uh, you know, a helpless little infant. He had to learn how to what? To walk. And it's fun to watch a little one go through those stages. Usually when I ask somebody with a young child, I'll ask them, you know, what kind of, what are the latest tricks, you know, that they've learned. Maybe it's rolling over, maybe it's uh, crawling, maybe it's standing up, maybe it's taking that first step or those first words. But Jesus had to learn those things too as in his human nature. And it's his human nature somehow that he doesn't know. 
he doesn't know when he himself is going to come back in power and glory. And maybe it's better that way, that it's a secret. That's what Jesus says. So that day of his return is a secret, and it's also going to be a surprising day. And he goes on and he gives the example of Noah. Noah, he says, was going to build that ark, and if you know the whole story, this goes all the way back to Genesis. Noah's told to build an ark because God is going to judge the world. And if you remember, he was already pretty old. He was like, the Bible says, 500 years old. And he didn't put this ark up in a hurry. It took him 100 years between him and his sons and whoever else he had to help him, 100 years to build it. And in all that time, he was told to preach. And when he was told to preach, he was told to tell people that they needed to change. They needed to repent and come with him. And all they did was mock him, made fun of him. He was building his ark out in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near any, even any water. And really, if you think about it, he wasn't very successful in his preaching. Because when the floods did come, the only people who really believed him and got in the ark with him were his three sons and their wives and his own wife. Eight people, the Bible says. But he had done it. He had warned them. And it says, Jesus said, the rest of the people just went on living. They went on living. They, they were eating and drinking. They were having babies. They were getting married. They were doing all the things that people do. They were getting older. They were dying. Life was going on as usual for these people until the day that the floods came. And then it was too late for them to change. Life just went on. And in some ways, if you think about it, he says it's going to be like that. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a surprise when he comes. And we're, you're just going to be living your life. If he comes during our lifetime, we're going to do the things we do. There's going to be babies born. There's going to be babies baptized. There's going to be little ones in school. We're going to watch over them. They're going to get older. They're going to move away. They're going to do what they do. We're going to get older. And life is going to go on. In congregations, People are going to come and go. Pastors are going to come and go. Uh, roofs are going to leak, <laughs> have to get fixed. Things just happen, and life goes on until that day that he's going to come. And it's going to be a surprise. And he tells us to be ready every day. In the Gospels, Jesus tells, and it's hard to tell if it's a parable or just a story that he made up, but he tells a story about a rich man who had everything he could ever want and a very poor man named Lazarus. And this man, Lazarus, this is not the Lazarus who was a friend of Jesus, you remember that, with his sisters Mary and Martha, the Lazarus that died and Jesus brought back to life. That's another real guy. This was a story that he told, a parable, trying to teach us something. And he tells a story about the rich man who had all this food and this fancy house and a man named Lazarus who kind of sat at his door kind of begging for scraps or whatever he could get and never really improved in this life, his standard of living. And he says, well, they both died in due time. And Lazarus goes to heaven and he's there with Abraham and enjoying that benefit of heaven. And the rich man is in hell. And there's a chasm between them. There's a wide opening. And somehow in this story, the poor man can see Lazarus up in heaven by Abraham. And he says to Abraham, there's a conversation going on somehow. And he says to Abraham, could you get Lazarus, just, just take his finger and dip it in the water there and touch my tongue to relieve some of this agony that I'm experiencing here in hell. Could he do that, just that one little thing for me? And Abraham says, no, he can't. There's this chasm between us, and he can't come to you, and you can't come to us. And that's, if you think about heaven and hell, that's going to be one of the sad, sad things about it. There's no changing at that point. And well, then the rich man in hell 
keeps thinking and he thinks, well, if he can't help me, I still have some brothers on earth still alive. Is there some way that you could send someone from heaven, someone who's died, back to earth and warn my brothers? Warn them so they don't end up here with me in hell. And Abraham says, no, we can't do that either. We're not going to. And Abraham even says, your brothers have Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. They have basically the Bible, God's word. And in God's word, they have everything they need to know. If they would read it and believe it, they would end up in heaven with us. And the man in hell says, well, I don't know if that'll work, but if you would just send someone from the dead back and tell them, they would believe. And Abraham said, no, they wouldn't. They have God's word, and they don't believe it. They wouldn't believe even if a man or someone came from death back to life and told them. And if you take that story another step and think about it and think about our Lord and think about our present situation, maybe someone would still say, well, if, if someone from who had died came back and told them what heaven was like and warned them about the dangers of hell, people would believe it and people would change. But if you really think about it, it's already happened. Jesus died. He dies on Friday. He's in the tomb on Saturday. And Sunday morning, he rises again physically. He was touched. He could eat. He talked to his friends. 500 people, it says in the Bible, at one time saw him after the resurrection. It's a fact that happened, and people don't believe it. Even today, people can read about it, this resurrection and all these things, and they don't believe it. So when he comes, sadly, it's going to be a very surprising day. In Romans chapter 13, what we had for our epistle, it says the day is approaching. And I think of it this way, today we're one day closer to that judgment day than we were yesterday. It's approaching. And we might not be alive on the day that he comes down in his glory with the angels and the trumpets and all of that from heaven, where every eye will behold him. Maybe we won't be alive then, who knows. But even if we're not, it's one day closer. Our day, if you want to think about it, our day of judgment, the day that maybe we die, is one day closer because nothing's really going to change from the moment we die to that day of judgment. If we die in the faith, we're going to be risen in the faith. If we die without it, it's not going to magically happen after we die. We'll be lost, and people will be. It's a secret. That day is going to be surprising. Other way, places he talks about it coming like a thief in the night, he talks about it as something that we have to be ready for. And it's also a day of separating. What does he say in the gospel? He says one will be here and one will be left. One will be doing this and one will be left. The idea is that one will go to heaven, one won't. It's a day of separation. I don't know if there's, I know there's seven billion people in the world. There might be closer to eight billion people. And how many know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Only God knows that. But maybe, as best as we know, people who say they're Christian is about two, I don't think it's three billion people. And that's the case, as far as we know, there's five, maybe, billion people who don't. And if the Lord came today, that would be a day that they would be separated with no hope, those in heaven with Abraham and those in hell with that rich man, they're not going to cross that chasm. That day of separation is going to happen where God in his infinite mercy and wisdom and justice is going to make that judgment. He's not going to make one mistake either. 
Sometimes people, men or women, have ended up in jail when they've been innocent. Or maybe they've gotten free because, because they were, had a good lawyer or enough money, and, but they were guilty. There's not going to be any mistakes on that judgment day. The Lord knows the heart and the mind of every person. He's not going to make one mistake and say, whoops, uh, sorry, you go back here or you go up there. That's not going to happen. There's going to be a separation that's going to be eternal. He knows his own. He knows everyone in the invisible church. In the creed, we talk about the, the church, the holy church. There's one holy church in the world. There's one church of believers who believe and know Jesus Christ, and God knows that church. To our eyes, it might be invisible. We're in the, what we're called the visible church. You're here, I'm here, I can see you. But that invisible church includes us, by the grace of God, and everyone else of every language and tribe who know Christ and believe in him. And on that day, those people will be with him in heaven. What a day it will be. Jesus has prepared a place for us, and he will take us to be with himself. There'll be a separation. Uh, the Bible talks about sheep and goats, separating the sheep and the goats, separating the wheat and the chaff, separating that. And on that day, that's going to happen. And there's not going to be any changes after that. What a day that'll be. And he says, be ready. Be ready for that day. And by, by being ready, he doesn't say, okay, it's, here it is. Be ready. Uh, some people have thought, I've told you before, it's a secret nobody knows. Some people have thought they figured it out, you know. <laughs> He's going to come on such and such a date, and we're all going to get together, and we're going to meet him there. Let's get on top of this hill so we can see him even sooner. And some people have believed this leader or prophet whoever it might have been. It's happened a number of times. And they get up on the hill and they sell everything or give it away because who needs that now in heaven? And the day comes, the hour comes, and they're looking for Jesus, and he doesn't come. And then the leader has to backtrack a little bit. He says, well, let me look at my notes here. <laughs> let me look in the Bible for some more clues. Oh, yeah, yeah, I made a mistake. And then he'll come up with another date. This has happened too. He comes up with another date, and they gather again. And Jesus doesn't come. That day that no one knows is not there. That day of separation, they're still waiting for. He just says simply to us, you're not going to know, but he says, be ready. Stay awake and work. Be busy doing my work while you wait. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, there was a problem. Somehow the word got to St. Paul. People were thinking about those last days. They were thinking about Jesus and his return. And some of the questions were about those who are dying. What about those who die before he comes back? And that's when he says the famous words, and I've said it many times at a funeral, you know, he, don't, don't fret, don't worry, but have hope in the resurrection. Be sure of this, that Jesus who went to the heaven will come back with a trumpet call and he'll call you. And those who die in Christ will rise first and then we will join them. Don't worry about them, they're fine, is what he says. They were thinking Jesus was going to come back pretty soon. And if you look at his history while he was on earth, he would go away he went out in the desert, what, for 40 days and was tempted, and he came back. Then he would go off to pray by himself and come back. And even when he died, he had told them three times at least, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to come back to life. No one believed it, but on that third day he did. Then 40 days later he ascended into heaven, and the angel said, just as you see him go, he'll come back someday. And don't you think it would be logical? Okay, <laughs> it would be pretty soon. He came back after three days when he died, and that 40-day thing, he did that a few times. So they kind of waited around Jerusalem for him to come on back. 
and then he doesn't. Three days pass, 40 days pass, the months pass, the years pass, they turn into decades. People, even St. Paul, if you read his epistles, it almost like he believes Jesus was going to come back pretty soon. There's one point where he talks about marriage. He says, well, be like me. I'm not married. And why be married if Jesus is going to come back pretty soon? If you're not married, you can be busy doing God's work. You don't have to worry about your wife. You don't have to worry about your husband, kids, things like that. You can dedicate yourself to the Lord. He's thinking Jesus is coming back pretty soon too. But then he doesn't. And people are waiting. And then in Thessalonica, this little town that Paul writes to, he hears that there's some people who have decided that Jesus is going to come back so soon that they're just kind of going to sit around, quit going to work, quit worrying about this and that, and just wait. <laughs> and it's in Thessalonians, I forget if it's the first book or the second book, the famous verse that maybe your grandmother told you when you were a kid, that if you don't work, you don't what? You don't eat. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard that, but that comes out of that book. And St. Paul says, you've got to work. You've got to be doing what God wants you to do. He's laid these things out for you to do in your life. Do them, and do them as you wait for his return. So he kind of yells at them a little bit, and he does that. And he's telling the same to us and to this congregation. Until I come back, do what I have you do. He even gave us, if you remember later on, the very last chapter of Matthew, a commission. He says, go and what? Make disciples. Go and baptize. Little ones like Hayden. Go and teach in your school and in your church and in your home. Be doing these things until I say you're done. And then I'll call you and the rest of everyone else to me. So until then, we work. We're ready, we watch, and we work, and we serve our Lord. St. Paul wrote this benediction at the end of 1 Thessalonians, and I'll give it to you too. He says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The prayers of the Church. Stir up your power, O Lord, to rescue us from the dangers of this dark world by the advent of your Son, that we may ever walk in his light and learn the way of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, though we do not know the day or hour of your Son's appearing, grant that we would always be prepared by sending us faithful pastors and teachers who will boldly proclaim your word of law and gospel to us that we may be constantly encouraged and built up in faith. Lord, in your mercy. O God of Jacob, you have established your kingdom as a beacon to call all nations unto yourself. Teach us to walk in the light of your peace. 
Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of love, visit our homes and defend us from the temptation to walk in the works of darkness, that husbands and wives may love one another and raise their children in the faith. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Lord, you are the authority to whom all temporal authorities must bow. Give wisdom and godly insight to our president, our governor, and all who make, administer, or judge our laws. Grant peace among the nations, that swords may be beaten into plowshares and spears to pruning hooks. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Lord, look with mercy upon the sick. Visit them during these Advent days to comfort them with your saving gospel. If it be your will, grant healing and peace to Chad Ader, Deb McLeod, Pastor and Edith Ross, Dick Went, Carol Chevalier, Carol Wilkerson, Gail Weedy, and all for whom we pray. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, loving Father, you alone know the day and the hour when our Lord Jesus Christ will come again in glory. Keep us steadfast in the one true faith that we may ever be ready for his reappearing through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. The offertory begins on page 159. Please rise as we sing. in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The benediction as we go to serve our Lord. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. As we go to serve the Lord until he calls us home and the rest of us into heaven. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Please be seated for the closing hymn, Once You Came in Blessing. <laughs> 